All right, looks like I'm live recording here. I'm gonna go ahead and maximize that and just keep doing what I do. Hey, coach, how you doing today? Pretty good, man. Sorry about that. Hey, there's no problem. I got I got the day off. I'm just, you know, gave me some time to do some more editing and everything. What's up? How's this going? It's it's going good. It's going all right. I've uh I've had a couple shows. I do Monday. I've been doing Monday episodes. I just finished uh, this Monday's episode for like uh, I do like news updates and then history yeah. stuff, and then. I recorded so far two recordings with other people and I actually have somebody already in line for next weekend for a recording. Mostly. Yeah. Mostly just like conversations, nothing too productive, but like interesting subjects talking about like, you know, weird, unique things. Like one of the other guys was a dad. So like we got onto the dad thing for a little bit, you know how that is. (laughs) Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. But I will say the the one I've been the most excited for is this one because you know you're you're a really educated individual, you're a really smart guy, and you've obviously you know you've had a pretty pretty unique life, I would say, compared to some of my other friends. So I think uh I think this one will be the one where I have like the most questions. No, that's cool, man. You you ask away. I don't know about the pretty smart guy part, but I can uh <laughs> I can answer on any of the other stuff. Well, um, so what was uh what's your um how do I word this? Uh, I don't want to say what your, your, your story, but like uh, how to early life look for, uh, by the way, I'm going to reference you to, as coach Tyson, cause it's what I'm used to, but you're not actually a coach anymore. Right. You're right. You, yeah, moved, no, cool. you moved up a little bit in the world, right? You're a, little uh, up there. <laughs> a, a little bit more problems, more problems for sure. More problems, less fun. Which, um, which did you prefer though? Which do you think you had uh, like uh, coaching or, you know, being a principal? What do you, if, if you, you know what? I will say this. The hours are longer coaching, but the stress is greater as a principal. Okay. So, okay. um, and coaching, you know, you're dealing with all the stuff that you like. Mm-hmm. That's not always the case with, with being a principal, especially right now. <laughs> um, it's fun, but right now, yeah, right now is an interesting time. Oh, yeah, it's definitely, yeah. Shit, don't get me started. I won't use profanity. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, early life, dude, is, is really, is interesting. It's, it's a lot different from Northern Virginia, growing oh, yeah. up in rural, uh, Alabama. And, you know, my mom's a school teacher. My dad was a principal, but my dad was not, not around. Uh, they divorced when I was like five. You know, he's abusive to my mom, yada, yada. So grew up, have a twin sister, two older siblings, and had a single parent mom was teaching school in Alabama. So that was a bit of a struggle at times. And I, I remember in the seventh grade, like for picture day, I wore my mom's old exercise shoes, tennis <laughs> shoes. These felines were like a two inch thick sole, dude. Like used to see in like the seventies workouts. And, yeah. uh, and I had on my older brother's hand-me-downs uh, shirt and uh, jeans, man. And it was like green and it was like a green and gray plaid shirt. But that was like what we had at the time. And that was a seventh grade. And so my mom really, started getting on her feet about my like freshman year in high school and we moved and she bought our first house since the divorce which had been like you know 10 or 15 years at uh like 10 years I think my junior year in high school and so it kind of went from there man just uh you know high expectations when it came to grades because she was Mm -hmm. a teacher so I remember literally crying my sister and I we were so angry that she was forcing us to take advanced classes like, I did not want to take AP and honors classes. Oh and she's God. like, we, you have no choice. And uh, she forced us to, and it was always a house rule that we could never be in the same class. And so I was like, I don't feel like being the only black kid in all these damn classes. <laughs> and I had no choice. And I'm like, the only other person who would have been in there is my twin sister. And so most of my friends were not in my classes um, you know, that I played football with. So I wouldn't see them until the end of the day. So it, it was an interesting experience. I, I loved high school. It was fun. Um, I wouldn't say my high school was very diverse. It was kind of like an even split. Like it was 48% white and 44% black. Um, this was in Alabama, right? Yeah, this is in yeah. Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, because actually I think that was the most interesting part about when I moved to Virginia and I was going to school. To, uh, I started going to school at Broad Run. I'd moved from a rural part of Alabama out in Prattville, Alabama. 
yeah. and then when I met you and you're like yeah I'm from Mobile Alabama I was like oh shit like <laughs> I didn't think I'd <laughs> see another Al- Alabamian up here <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a lot, man. And I and I originally grew up in Enterprise, Alabama, which is even closer mm-hmm. to Prattville. Um, and I moved yeah. to Mobile right before uh, high school, like the summer of my freshman year, because my granddad, his health wasn't doing too well, and my mom wanted to be closer. And so uh, he eventually passed when I was in college. But that's how I ended up going to school in Mobile. But I grew up born and raised in Enterprise, Alabama. Man, I tell you, I have a like hearing the story about your mom and like taking care of me and everything, dude. I got a whole new respect for that. Like telling me that story like like a year ago, I would have been like, oh yeah, that must have been tough, you know. But like now, like as a dad, like just dealing with a kid, and I have a partner, you know, my wife. I'm not gonna lie, she does all the heavy lifting. Like yeah. the other yeah. day, I'm in trouble. I'm actually in trouble right now because the other day I had to be like this little play area and the couch, like with the couch. And she's like, all right, watch him. I'm gonna make dish. I'm gonna like make uh do dishes and cook. And I'm like, all right, bet I just gotta watch the baby. I fall asleep. And <laughs> this dude decides to crawl under the couch. What <laughs> he gets under the couch. <laughs> Cause he like knocked a toy under there. So my wife comes in the living room and she goes. Okay. Okay. Husband, check. Dog, check. Where's my kid? And she's like, Richard. Uh, and I wake up and she's like, get off the couch. Cause like her mom and things, she instantly knew. I was like, what, where's, where's Aiden? She's like, you tell me. And I'm like, oh shit. I lift up the couch and he just sits up and looks at me and just starts laughing. But I'm like, there's like little things like that, like obstacles being like a couple taking care of a kid. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, single parents have a whole new respect for like from me. Like I look at it, I'm like, dude, I could, I don't know if I like you're you get tough enough to do it, but it's just like you oof, man, whole dude, new I respect. Don't know, I don't know how she did it. And 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 to have twins, so like at the same time, like and and then we still had and granted, my brothers, my brothers were a little more independent, but still, you know, one was seven and the other was eleven when we were born. And I'm like, <laughs> to do it by yourself with zero help with two kids and we were all in sports right growing up so it was all four of us actually all four of us received um athletic scholarships wow. uh, as well as um my sister and I had academic full rides and my sister also had an uh, academic I mean a full band scholarship and so you like she got us to all these different sports like I have no I don't have kids right now yet and yeah. I still don't know how like it's hard for me to do that for myself. Like, <laughs> other people, man, and work a full time job. Yeah. That's crazy. My, my mom is definitely my my superhero. I tell people yeah. all. The, yeah. Everything I, I learned. Man, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, like, not only was she like, did she do the single mom thing? She like successfully did it. Like, you know, like, like she did it and like was able to make sure you guys accomplish things. Yeah, man, she that she is. made it work, and uh, and then she also looked after other kids. You know that that's why my mom's a huge inspiration and big part of why I even went into education. But she would always find a way to like take care of other kids. Like if they didn't have food or clothes or supplies or money, she was always taking her own money, um, even what little bit she had, and making it work for others, man. So like that's why I'm in education and. Yeah. That's why it frustrates me when I see now, like, you know, people saying all this, all this crazy crap about educators and teachers. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you guys have no idea the sacrifice that they make. Oh, yeah. Like, no, no one's a teacher for the paycheck or the hours. Like, no one gets into cheap teaching going, that, that amount of pay? Yeah, I'll do it for that. That's good. You know, like, they do it because they're passionate, you know, because they want to, yeah. you know, because they want to be teachers, yeah, it's interesting. Like I, I, you know, I see people screaming about these school openings, which I get. I mean, I get it. I see the mm-hmm. the coin on both sides. Um, what I don't get is the immense amount of disrespect that's been levied at public educators and school systems. And it's yeah. like, you know, some of these people get on there and get righteous and indignant. Like we care about our kids, and I'm like, really, really? <laughs> you don't you don't think the people who actually committed their life to doing this? for not a lot of money and a whole lot of disrespect care about kids they're just doing this because they can find an easier job to do like it's unbelievable man um that's been the most frustrating part and then having to turn around and look in the face of teachers who are upset and want to quit or switch careers just because of their respect disrespect man so it's been interesting 
it's it's one of those things I look at it and uh, as a mediocre salesman at some of these like sales jobs, you could make as much, if not more than a public educator, you know, so like they're definitely they're definitely there for something more than the paycheck, which is something I think everyone needs to like that's what they need to start with thinking about when they're going to have a conversation about public education. Cause like I have my gripes about the public education system, right. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's you having gripes are justified, but like the people who are working in the system aren't the problem. It's, it's the bureaucracy and the, the, the regulations on the education system passed by people who aren't educators. That's causing most of the problems. Yeah. I say that all the time. I'm just like, you know, and I don't know a whole lot about a bunch of other professions, but I'm like school being in a school system. I swear we got to be one of the only places where the people who determine and create policy for what we do are not practitioners. Like they're not educators. Yeah. They have nothing to do with education. Just people from the community who get together and then they get to decide to make these policies. And but the people who catch the brunt of whatever shortcomings there are. And there, believe me, there are issues with public education and there are issues with any other um, industry. But I'm like, to level the disrespect of those people, I'm like, you need to talk to the folks that you elected <laughs> to be in this position. Because they're like, well, I don't understand why you can't just do this. I'm like, because there's a policy that says that I can't. Um, right. So, so know, like, yeah, I think the big, biggest example is like, um, what's her name, Davos or whatever, the secretary of oh, education. DeVos. Yeah. yeah, DeVos. I don't think I met a single person on either side of the aisle, conservative, liberal, uh, Democrat or Republican that like <laughs> liked her policies or said anything positive about her, you know? And I'm just kind of like, how is she like, how is she in char- like in this position if so many people are universally against it? You know? Yeah, it, it was, you know, her thing was with the school choice thing. And- mm-hmm. And so I, I can understand arguments for it. Um, I'm not for it. I, I think that it is it's skirting responsibility to a certain extent. And, and the reason I say that is because we should be looking to fix schools mm-hmm. that are broken. Like you don't ever have to fix kids. Like kids aren't broken. Mm-hmm. Like we need to fix the system. Um, and so when you do that, you say, okay, hey, all you guys can go over here. Well, that is a luxury and a privilege that everyone doesn't have. Not every family can afford to send their kids to another school, even if it's free. You still have to have the transportation and the means to get there and all of that good stuff. And so it's like, well, what happens when you pull these kids out and you take dollars out of this school as it continues to go down and it, all it does is widen the gap. And you want to close the gap. You don't want to close the gap by holding up those who are ahead, but you want to bring forth those who are behind and that's just not the way to do it. And um, and then people don't realize that like, I mean, really, like I made a, a, a tweet the other day. I was like, you know, the 2020, 21 year has taught me that schools need to place a greater emphasis on, on history, on civics, on government and biology. Mm-hmm. And you know, that, that pissed some people off, go figure <laughs> that. But I'm like, listen guys, the way the government <laughs> works, I'm like, you have states rights. so. You have the federal government and you have Betsy DeVos. Generally speaking, the federal government only makes up, federal funds only make up about 10 to 20% of a school district's budget. The vast majority of it comes from state and local. Mm -hmm. With most, normally it's somewhere around the ratio, give or take, is about 50% comes from local funds with about 30 to 40 that comes from state funds and about 10 to 20%. So, when you see things like, you know, our past uh, president or best advice, they're like, we're going to withhold money from these school systems. You're really talking about a very small amount, not enough to change anything. And the school systems that receive the most federal funds are the poorest ones. Mm-hmm. So when you have your Title I and a high number of free and reduced lunch, then you get more federal funds to kind of even the playing field. So it's like what they're saying is they're literally threatening to hurt the poorest schools. Districts like Loudoun and schools there, it ain't gonna suffer. A minimal, minimal yeah. effect. And yeah. so it's just kind of wild, man. Yeah, it is. I, I think uh, so. I'm like big on this. Like, so my brother has a kid who's 11 days older than mine. 
and then cool. yeah right they're going and they're like within 10 minutes 15 minutes of each other they're going to grow up awesome but like we were already talking about like doing some homeschooling stuff you know working with each other creating like a homeschooling program with like maybe them and like a couple other kids around their age where like the parents can rotate and do all this so i started doing a lot of research into homeschooling and i was actually going to ask you what do you think about like in the states or whatever incentivizing parents more so towards homeschooling because there is an upwards trend of homeschooling becoming more popular even before the pandemic and most homeschooled students regardless of parents education level tend to do i think it's like 15 better by like 15 to 30 percentile better than public school students also in like and that's like like non-white uh the like 40 something percent of all homeschooled kids are non-white anglo like so they're they're of the minorities and they do better as well so it, it seems to benefit everyone across the board for the most part. So what do you think about like states incentivizing parents to homeschool more? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure about the incentivizing part. I would, you know, I would just have a question on where does that money um, come from? You know, does yeah. it come from schools? Is there uh, a separate, what is the funding source? But mm -hmm. I will say this, I believe that people should have the option to do what works best for their family. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do believe in that um without it without it hurting someone else right and mm -hmm. so i think there are pros and cons to everything you know the one thing that typically happens in the earlier stages sometimes in the later stages with homes kids we see from homeschooling is they academically they're fine and they will do just fine where they seem to have some struggles is when it comes to the socialization piece mm -hmm. because they haven't been around as many other kids and been in certain situations now, some people want that and, and some people will homeschool until they get to high school and they're like, okay, we want them to become more socialized because they're going to go to college and homeschooling is really not an option in college mm -hmm. and go out into the workforce. And so I think there are pros and cons. You know, the pro is that, is that you know, you can incorporate more of what you think is important. Uh, you Maybe you can teach history a lot more accurately mm -hmm. than what some regulations have stopped but um, or, or what some regulations don't allow for. But also, like I said, on the other side, a big piece of why kids don't do too well and what you're starting to see public schools shift now. And Virginia is, is what would be considered a more progressive state when it comes to education. Yeah. They're moving away. They have four pillars that basically they want kids to master skills in, in order to graduate. Mm -hmm. Now, only one of those pillars is test scores because we're seeing that, yes, kids have mastered how to, uh, a lot of kids can take tests. They score very high, but then they lack the soft skills. So that's what the employers are telling us is that, hey, yeah, kids come in with knowledge, but they can't work with a team. They can't like, you know, be a, what I call a ball player. You know, you have your rules that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And there are times where you just need to like play ball. And so that's what we're seeing from industry. They're saying kids are lacking these soft skills. That's why they're not getting interviews. You know, they can't land certain deals. And so that's a big part of it. Um, you know, if somebody can figure out how to do that. Then I say, hey, you know, go for it. I feel that I feel that because like one of the things is I always got good grades in school when I well I don't say always because like the first two years I was really bad about skipping yeah. and I know this because I got to know you real well because you would always catch me in the hallway <laughs> <laughs> when I wasn't supposed to be in the hallway but um I was really good at taking tests and I got good at taking tests because I learned that's all you need to be successful in school but then when I got out of school that didn't help me like, you know, like going to college, that really didn't help me that much. Um, thankfully, I joined the military and I also had a very like my family, my home situation was really weird and unique. So that gave me a bunch of skills I didn't learn in school. But honestly, if my family hadn't been as dysfunctional as it was and I didn't learn those skills by force at home, I wouldn't have learned them at school. And honestly, I don't know where I would be modern day. So like hearing that we're starting to shift away from like test, test, test is like, I, I really like that. Um, yeah, they're phasing them out, man. Like I, you guys had to take like, I think it was around like nine SOLs and I passed nine SOLs to graduate. That, that's that been sliced down to five now and they're slowly phasing those out and doing more like career readiness. Um, and I'm, why can I not think of the name right now? <laughs> that's bad because I'm a principal. Um, but different types of assessments where kids do more of demonstrating their skills and having to apply them versus simply taking a test. 
Okay. So performance you, assessment. <laughs> yeah. Performance yeah. Assessment. yeah, I will say uh I will say it, Loudoun County was really unique. So I went from like one, I got screwed. So SOL was a proper term <laughs> because when I moved from Alabama, right before yeah. I left Alabama, I did all my state testing. Then I moved to Virginia and they're like, all right, well. We're going to, you know, kind of give you a little extra like focus from the teachers because the SOLs are in a few weeks and you, you're you going to have to take them. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? And like, because I'm military family. So I'm like, what do you mean I'm shit out of luck? What do you mean? <laughs> and they were like, like, no, no, no. There are state standardized tests. And I was like, oh, I already took those in Alabama. They're like, yeah, we don't care. You got to take them here. So I had to take the state test in Alabama and then take the state test in Virginia. I will say there was definitely um, an education level difference. You know, yeah. the, you, the quality of education, like you don't realize the difference until you jump. Like, I think one of the problems is too many people stayed in the same school system most of their life. So like they, they don't see that there's a huge difference based on what schools you go to. So like going from Florida to Kentucky to Alabama, to Virginia, and then graduating in Delaware, I saw huge differences in the way different subjects are taught, uh, when subjects are taught. I, I think that's really important. And that's what you guys do in Loudoun County that I consider a good idea. Civics or U.S. government or whatever, you guys don't teach it till like se- senior year, right? Like that's when you really have it at covered. Yeah, mo- most of them, when, they, when they're able to vote. Yeah. So in the more rural communities I grew up in, it's freshman subject. It, you know, U.S. civics, it's taught your eighth grade and freshman year kind of deal. Yeah, civics is around there, but then government is later. Yeah. So they don't have government. They just cover that in civics. You know what I mean? So that yeah. that happened. So like in Delaware, they didn't have a U, they didn't really focus on U.S. government. They're just like you take civics class freshman year that covers all of it. And that's just not that's not true. <laughs> like lear- one learning it in freshman year, when it comes time to vote, you're not going to remember half that shit. <laughs> and no. they're definitely not going to cover it in depth. When you learn it your senior year, you're like, wait, okay, I got to know this shit for like three months for now. Okay. Okay. You know, <laughs> like, and you yeah. get real serious about it. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's something that's like r- also something a lot of rural public schools don't get to like, I don't know if they don't think about it or they don't have the the, the ability to really research it as to when to teach certain classes, you know? Yeah, it's interesting, man. Like, different states can develop their, their stuff. Like, you have federal guidelines, mm-hmm. but then you have state stuff. So, you know, Virginia's going to teach Virginia history. I was going to teach Alabama history, and whoever wrote that curriculum is going to be somebody that wrote it from their perspective. Uh, that's just the truth. Uh, but it does make it, it's funny you say that, because kids, Northern Virginia, provides a pretty good education. Um, When we have kids that transfer from other places, even within the state of Virginia, Mm -hmm. Southern Virginia, they struggle immensely. And most of the time that we see it, it's in math. And uh, it's the level of math that they've been exposed to and the pace at which which Mm -hmm. they've been exposed to. And it's like it never failed. Uh, You know, when I was at Stonebridge, we had that happen all the time. Kids would come and they would struggle there because they taught it differently in the system they came from, or they didn't get as far as fast. And so it really depends, man, uh, which is where I think the most important piece that is oftentimes missing is the the home reinforcement, right? So it's like, no, it it is a partnership. And I think people forget that sometimes, like education Mm -hmm. is a partnership between families and the school system. And what we oftentimes will see is people have begun to push more and more on the school system for like everything, like your moral code, you're just everything you get that at school. And so you will draw from that. You you see the kids who have a better support system at home, um, especially the teachers, they tend to perform a little bit better than those that don't. That's not always the case. There are no absolutes in education, but there are some things that we can, we can see trends in. And so that's one. Yeah. I will say, I would say, um, working like the schools aren't like the schools and the parents aren't supposed to be like the school's not the employee of the parent technically you know you don't look at a teacher as like the same way you look at the person who's behind the counter when you go to buy something somewhere you know it's not a transaction so like when I was younger my family was kind of like yours in the sense that like if you got a C in anything oh god like we're not average people in this family 
<laughs> we're not allowed to be average. You have to be above average. Um, we actually had it. We were mandatory to do a s- extracurricular of some kind. Like I was, so I did football and we did soccer. Um, and that is until we moved to Virginia. And then like the whole like crazy family story happened and I ended up living on my own. I don't know if you, like when I was in high school, I was like living by myself the whole time. Sure, I didn't know that. I wouldn't afford you. <laughs> well, like my dad, well, my dad owned the house and like I lived in my dad's house, but he was he wasn't there most of the time. Yeah. So and it's because he worked two jobs and every weekend he was driving to Delaware to see the other family. So it got re- really complicated. So I didn't do sports in high school, but until high school, it was you had to do sports and you had to, you know, and the teachers were always like talking to the parents and the parents were talking to the teachers like there would be oftentimes that I would come home and like a report card didn't, didn't go out. But somehow my dad still knew like, hey, you, I heard you did bad on a test, man. What's up? And I'm like, what are, yeah. talking, like, what are you talking about? How do you know this already? You know, and like the teachers had the parents phone numbers. And I think. But I think that's also a benefit you only get in like rural areas. I, I think it would be really hard to have something such a personal relationship in Loudoun County, but I don't think that means we shouldn't strive for it, right? Yeah, I, I think you should. And growing up, it was like that in Alabama, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, I always had to go to school where my mom worked. Um, I feel like <laughs> I got out of elementary school, so that sucked. But uh, what I see here is uh, down south, at least, I'll speak from that perspective. It's more of a partnership. Uh, it seems like in Northern Virginia is more adversarial. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's directly um, attached to the wealth here. But people oftentimes feel like they know more than teachers. And I'm like, listen, just because you went to school doesn't mean that you know how to teach. It also doesn't mean you know how to run one. I'm like, hey, you guys go to the doctor, been going to the doctor your whole life. But it doesn't mean that you know more than the doctor knows. And you go to Walmart every day. It doesn't mean you can run the store. You know how some things work. But mm-hmm. that's on a basic level. Like, you have to be specifically and specially trained for this. And so sometimes, you know, you, I, don't, I don't really take anything personal that comes from parents. Because what I assume is always good intentions, right? So I yeah. always assume, listen, you want the best for your kid. I, I'm, I, however, am the expert in helping kids succeed academically and uh, socially, emotionally. And so I'm exposed to a wide, a much wider range. And mm-hmm. oftentimes what parents know is limited to either their kids or their kids and their kids' friends or their friends that have kids. And like I try mm-hmm. to explain to people, you may be, hey, in a parent group where it's 30 or 40 of you, and that seems like a lot. But I'm like, but the reality is, is there are 2,000 parents in my school. So all of you may be feeling this and talking about this, but that's not the experience of everyone else. And my job as a, which is where it becomes, you know, with the public school is I have to provide something that works for all of the kids. And then where we can enhance or we need to pull back, we work and try to do that. But I can't just say, this is what's best for your kid. So I'm going to do that for every single kid. Yeah. What's best for every kid. You know, that the biggest mistake people make with education is assuming that there's a one size fits all and there isn't. Kids are different, parents are different, people are different. So it's not gonna be something that works 100% of the time for every single kid. Our job is to just continue to figure out what works best for all of our kids and support them uh, where we can with the means and resources that we have. Yeah, man, that, yeah. that It definitely sounds like a tough job, tough job. I, do, I am not envious. <laughs> it's, it's rewarding man um it is very rewarding and uh you know it's my passion so and it's people's passion that go into education i mean you you mm-hmm. had to go to school for four years for this and then in line county you know about 70 to 75 percent of teachers had a master's degree so they've been in school at least like six years for this yeah. so it's insulting when people come in and they're like no this is the way you should teach and they want to listen, <laughs> listen. Like, I went to school for six years for this. Um, and sometimes they make valid points. Not saying they're always wrong. But you're like, where does all this mistrust come from? Because it's not like our kids aren't performing well. They're, they're getting into college. They're doing well post-secondary uh, once they graduate. But, uh, yeah, this pandemic has brought out the worst than a lot of people. Man. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, my gosh. I could only the imagine. Absolute worst than a lot of people. You know, another thing I wanted to um, – I want to hit on with uh, 
during this was school boards. So some interesting happened in Virginia, in Winchester. I don't know if this is how it is in a lot, if it's normal and like Winchester's just behind the times or if they're actually doing something unique. They recently just passed a bill. School board members are not um, appointed. So like one of the things is like, you know how like the mayor or whatever appoints who's on the school board and everything. Yeah. That doesn't happen in Virginia and Winchester anymore. In Winchester, they, uh, they are voted on. Right. So they have to be like, and now they have to, they can't run with like a party affiliation. So they can't run like Democrat or Republican or anything. They just run independent. And uh, they actually have to like, it's a direct vote from the people on the school board. Part of me is like, that's awesome because, you know, the parents have a say in who's educating their kids. But then at the other, on the other end of that, I'm like, that just turned being in the school member of the school board into a popularity contest. So are there more pros to that or are there more cons to that? You know, what do you think? I, I think there are more pros. Most, most school systems, uh, that's how it operates. The, the school board members have the campaign. There are term limits and they have to be voted on. And I would say the biggest pro is being able to hold one accountable if they're mm-hmm. not doing their job versus if they're appointed, uh, you know, you can, <laughs> nepotism is real and so is yeah. cronyism. And I think we saw that a lot over the last four years is that. What are you talking about? I don't know what yeah, you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. We just got to have the greatest four years out. But, you know, when someone has the ability to do that, you then lose accountability uh, or, or the the ability to hold folks accountable. And mm-hmm. so I think that definitely the, the community should have a say in who runs their school and, and the term limits. But I, I do still think that much of what happens needs to be research-based and it needs to come from the people who understand it. Because yeah. uh, a lot of what I see is, and not that I think people have bad intentions or these parents have bad intentions, but some of the responses that we're seeing are emotional. Yeah. And they're based on opinions and not facts. And they're like, all of our kids are behind. And, you know, you don't want to be the a-hole and be like, okay, well, where's the data that shows that? Because I'm actually in a school every day. And yeah. I can tell you that kids are not this, this behind like people think with these standards because they don't also don't understand that what's actually required to be taught is a lot less than what is actually taught. So shaving yeah. off some, like, doesn't, doesn't hurt kids. What was it? The the homeschool thing I was talking about. When you look up the statistic for homeschool, it's like the thing that blew yeah. my mind was like any high schooler that's being homeschooled, they tell you they're like, realistically, you only need to, to do f- dedicate four hours a day to actual teaching. Anything above that is like not overkill, but like extra. So like you can dedicate that time to extracurriculars and all that. I'm like, so wait, you're telling me with like you realistically can get everything and that you need in like that four hours, you know, which kind of did I mean, highlight your point with like a yeah. bunch of the. Think about it, dude. You need like 24 credits to graduate in Virginia with a standard diploma, right? So that is six credits, six classes a year for four years. Well, how many blocks are there in a day? Eight. Kids take seven courses. <laughs> a year and can take as many as eight, which means you can range from, you know, up to 28, uh, I'm sorry, wait, eight times, 32 uh, course credits that you have. You only require for 24 for the advanced diploma. So that's how you get kids that senior year, they have early release every day because they've already passed more than they need to pass to graduate. Don't so even you get have started on that. Can, <laughs> yeah, you have kids who skip their whole senior year. I, um, I was lined up like that. So like I had my, my, my system set up because when I started dating my wife back in high school, uh, she really like started like getting me to go to school and stuff and dude, just like showing up to class, my grades jumped to the point in which I, uh, I was, I only needed to take three classes my senior year. And so I had it set up to where I was going to take those three classes. And then I was also going to take the work release program or whatever. I don't know if they still have that up there, but it was like, as long as you have a job. Yeah. The co-op, I was going to take that. And I had it set up to where I had every B day off. Yep. And so my job was right behind the school. And then, so it was B days off and then um, A days, I was going to have early release almost every day. So it was like, dude, this is, 
this is the life. And then I moved to Delaware and you're going to get a kick out of this. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. They have a rotating non-block schedule. So they have a rotating schedule. So they have seven periods a day, right? So very first school day, it's first period to seventh period. The, ver- the second school day, it's second period to seventh period with first period at the end of the day. Gotcha. And then the day after that, third through seventh, and then one, two at the end. And it does that until it rotates all the way back through. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's a lot of different. I mean, some people are still on the seven periods and, you know, 50 minutes a day. Yeah. Uh, when I was in Alabama, it was a, I was at a school that was under state control. So we actually had to add a block during the day, in the middle of the school year. And so the school day, and we had to extend the school day, it was eight and a half hours and they had eight blocks with a 30 minute lunch. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really a big advocate for school systems partnering with community colleges and junior colleges mm-hmm. so that kids can graduate with associate's degrees, which is one area I feel like Loudoun is, is very behind on. We offer dual enrollment courses but at the completion of those, a kid can be done with like their first semester of college, um, but they don't have a degree. And yeah. whereas in Frederick County and Winchester, you know, people are like, well, Lana County schools are much better. I'm like, yeah, but their kids can go to school and graduate high school with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. Yeah. And yeah. now they're only off to a four-year college for two years, or they, they have a skill that they've already mastered. Well, they can go out and immediately start making money. So I'm like, at the end of the day, you can't really just unilaterally say that Loudoun County school system is better than that one. It depends on how productive they are in society. And man, how you guys going? Like, how you guys going let Winchester pull ahead of you in any field? Hey man, you <laughs> any know, field. I don't, I don't know, man. But uh, I, if I had a choice as a parent, that's the option that I'd pick. I'm like, you're saving me money. And my kid's going to come out and be able to immediately go into mm-hmm. the job force and make some money. And if they have the option, you know, if they want to go to a four-year university, then now they only have to spend two years there versus four. And if you're talking yeah. about getting a two-year head start on generating wealth, and you have somebody who at age 20 can begin investing versus someone at age 22 or 23 or whatever, that's a significant head start and coming out with fewer student loans, that's mm-hmm. another significant advantage. So, um, you know, it depends. That's the route I choose, and I, I hope that we can work to make that happen in Loudoun. Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly, I'm wondering, like, I'm kind of like, there's a, I, I kind of assumed you guys had that. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, so, yeah, I hope that does. Credits. We have partnerships with a couple different universities, Richard Bland, James Madison, George Mason. Um, I'm forgetting somebody. Uh forgetting but you know so kids can take courses and they'll come out with you know 15 college credits or you know 20 college credits mm-hmm. but not an actual associate degree yeah yeah that's a i think that's one of the and another thing that like doesn't get talked about is joining the military you actually get college credits just from being in the military you know i think that's an interesting thing that i'm like a lot of my military buddies don't know that so they 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 start school and they start taking these classes and I'm like, why don't you just get your transcript and transfer it over? And they're like, yeah, what do you mean? I'm like, you have PE credits, you have uh, military science credits. And depending on what your job I had, I didn't realize until I put in my transcript, I had like, I want to say like 12 credits from my, my advanced schooling not from basic. So basic, I had the PE credits and the uh, uh, military science credit, but then I also have 12 extra like math and science credits due to the job I had in the military. So I'm like, oh shit. So I took like four classes and I ended up with my associates, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, college isn't that hard. Like if you're taught like how to, how to do it, like how to get your credits from, you know, everywhere. Like it's easier than high school. Yeah. <laughs> High school, you go to school for eight hours a day. In college, you don't, um, which is, again, what's funny to me. I'm like, do people not realize that when they're yelling at these kids are falling behind and stuff? But I would also say in Loudoun County, it's like mentioning the military is like it's taboo. Like people yeah. 
Yeah, like I literally have had families <laughs> that call me and they're like, do not allow my kid to talk to a recruiter. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, I won't send your kid to talk to a recruiter, but I'm not going to go stop a kid from going and speaking to a, um, a current military member. Or vet. That is something you need to talk about as a family. And I'm like, the so do, you love, that do you love recruiters in the school? Like, do they have, yes. do they get to set up stadium and like people can come talk to them? Yeah, yeah, okay. they do. And so sometimes our parents know that they'll call and they're like, don't let my kids go. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to treat our servicemen like they're some enemy that's coming to get your kid. And, and I have a lot of, a ton of buddies who are in the military and a lot who went to the military first and then went to school, and had their school paid for. It. And then I have the flip where I have uh, close friends that went to school first, but they went ahead and enlisted in the reserves and the contract they signed guaranteed, you know, after they graduate, they had to do at least two to four years of active service. And they can't, they were earning a paycheck while they were in college. So they always had money. They would go to their training a couple of weekends a month. And then once they graduated, they went active for four years. And like now one's a detective in uh, Pittsburgh. He was a, a, a police officer. And like, I'm like, that worked out great. And that's a great option. And he has no debt. He has the VA loans. I mean, he's in great shape for life. So I think one of the problems you have is a lot of these parents, one, they're, like you said, a part of it's got, got to do with the wealth in the community. So you don't have like yeah. a lot of military members in that area. You don't have a lot of veterans, you know, so you, you have people who don't know much about the military and now add in the, what they imagine as the military is grunts. So they're like, everyone yeah. in the military is an 11 bang, bang. You know, uh, they, they, they're riflemen, they're on the front lines. Oh, my God. Um, that's actually a very small fraction of the military, like yeah. really small. And that's like when I talk, when people talk about military budget, uh, I always love talking about they're like, we're spending so much money just to have all these big warships and everything. I was like, well, you realize like the military puts a lot of money towards vaccine develop development, um, medical research and education, uh, technology, like most of the technology we've gotten, like the big technology advancements came yeah. from military, you know, needing yeah, and they have it first. Yeah. Like laptops that was military developed, um, biometrics were the Navy kind of stole, not stole the technology, but commandeered the technology from Japan. And then <laughs> yeah. they started using it. And that's when it got introduced to the American market. And that's when we started using it in our cell phones and shit. So majority of the budget goes towards, well, one, it does go to fat, which is higher ranking officers, which is some, a whole nother military the issue I have with like, we have so many high ranking officers in the military that we don't need but they get in that position and they're like, oh, I'm just going to hold it until I age out. And it's like, all yeah. right, that's a little ridiculous. It would be like having like four principals for a small school, you know, like yeah. you, you don't need that many people. You, you, you don't need to be, you have too many, uh, what's the term? Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, so you ran into, we run into that issue in the military, but the budget's not that big. And most of our stuff is tech based. My job, I was in the army for 10, for, yeah, for how long? Nine years, seven years, seven years. Sorry, I was act. I was like in the military for seven years. I'm not mostly National Guard, but a lot of training, a lot of active training, like where I was gone doing like certifications and stuff like that because my job was so technical. Get your kids to do that shit. Like so many of these jobs, like they're not, they don't have to be a frontline shooter, which some of them will be. And that also has its benefits. My brother was in 11. Uh, 11 Bravo, or he was a 13 Fox with an 11 Bravo team, but he was a grunt pretty much. He has great leadership skills. Uh, the way he can talk to people, the, the charisma, like he gets jobs that he is completely uncertified for <laughs> yeah. because of his confidence. And you get that by being, you know, a grunt. So the, the stigma around the military, like letting kids go in the military, I, it's crazy. I, I learned a lot when I had the opportunity to go to Paris Island <clears throat> through um, this program that the Marines offer. Mm -hmm. And you get to go down there and you spend a week down there and learn about it. And you get there and one of the first things they tell you is they're like, listen, it's, you know, X amount of Marines. Uh, only about 4,000 are what we see when we envision like jokers, you know, scaling yeah. the hill and shooting and then firefights. They're like, 
all the vast majority are other jobs from cooks mm -hmm. to, you know, main to mechanics to, um, you know, transport, all kinds of stuff where you're not like dodging a bullet every single day. And, you know, their whole point was, you know, another thing is people are like, well, you want to send the kids there who, who aren't that smart. They're not going to cost them to the military. And it's like, no, no, these are like our best and brightest people. And you have folks who instead, you know, who chose the military instead of going to Harvard or Princeton or Howard or, you know, all these upper level um, universities. And I'm like, no, these really are the brightest people. And that's the people that you want defending the country and figuring out how to do this stuff. And so it's the, the whole perception in this area. Growing up in Alabama, I grew up right next to oh, so the different. Army Aviation Base. And it's totally different. Like that was the goal. It was like, hey, I'm going, you had to convince kids to even want to go to college. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, I'm going to the military uh, because that was what was all around us. And when I got here, I was shocked that I had parents who were like upset and like adamantly, like vehemently against their kids in the military. And I, I just, I couldn't believe that, man. That was, that was a shock to me. I'm like, how could you be against military personnel and your kids wanting to go and, and join that? Like what better place to get leadership skills and really life skills? Uh, so, and it was just interesting to me, man. You know, one thing I will say, all right. So I, now that I've hyped the military up and talked about how awesome it was, I will also go to the fact that it sucked. It was shit. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I like, <laughs> it was horrible. Okay. Um, but one of the biggest benefits I got from the military was like learning how to tolerate bullshit. Like, yeah. you know, being smarter than your boss and not telling your boss that is a skill you learn from the military that you will use for the rest of your life. It's a very <laughs> useful skill to me. Right. It, it is. Man, it's like, I look at it like anything, you know, like, playing sports and uh, and then playing at the collegiate level, the life of a student athlete is nowhere near as fun as what people think. All right. right? Cause you essentially, your life belongs to the university and the coach. And so all that other stuff that college kids get to do, you're not doing that. Like you're practicing every day and you're, you know, 20 hours of your day is filled with school and your sport. But the rewards are much, much greater, but also the skills that you learn. And like I tell people, like, it's a skill to learn to make yourself do stuff that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Like some people don't want to get up and do extra work, so they just roll over. But you're in the military or you play the sport, you don't have that option. Like, yeah, I woke up a lot of mornings at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like going and running and working until mm -hmm. I pass out. Even though I know this was, was good for me, yeah. But like, I got to get myself out of this bed and get myself down there and get to work. Whether I like it or not, it's secondary. It's what's most beneficial. And I even find that with jobs sometimes, people can't do that extra mile because they just don't feel like it. And they've never had to make themselves uh, get over that and get over themselves. And so I'm like, it, it's so many benefits to learning it. And the time to do stuff that really sucks is when you're younger. So you can reap the rewards and benefits of that when you're older and knowing what to do and how not to be in that situation again. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the big things about that is like that responsibility kind of falls on the generation above them, right? The, the parents Absolutely. and the teachers, because I'm going to be honest, when I was that age, I didn't want to do that shit. You couldn't convince me to just do yeah. that shit on my own. Like I, I was not going to come to that decision on my own. I needed people to be like, look, you need to get your shit together. And like, give me like, you know, Absolutely. give me goals. And like, I needed a uh, guidance, you know, and I got that guidance a lot. I'll be honest. I didn't have a lot of like in my family people to look up to. Um, I had, I think one of the biggest things I had is my older brother went to go join the military and that was really uh, shaping for me. But most of the people who shaped my, my personality and like how I developed were in the education system, mostly coaches, yeah. actually, and also mostly of color. I will say that. So like coach Moncrief, uh, coach Davis, you, you know, coach Tyson, you know, mostly, mostly people of like minority backgrounds. So, you know, they didn't have it easy because of the generation they came from and the areas they came from. And then also they're in education. And that goes back to like, if you're in education, you care about shaping the minds 
of the kids of the future. So like really without that, I, I definitely wouldn't be living in a house with a wife and a kid, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that your question you asked me earlier, you know, about being a principal or a coach. That's the thing I missed the most about being a coach was, was more direct contact mm -hmm. with, and being able to mold individuals more, you know, in, in, from the kid perspective, I get to do it now with adults. Um, I'll just say it, working with adults is nowhere near as fun as working with kids. So that's just that. Um, I love my staff and they're awesome and that's fun. But that direct contact of working with a kid and seeing the immediate results from them growing uh, mm -hmm. is irreplaceable. And that, that I do miss uh, because the, the people who had the biggest impact on my life were my coaches. You spend so much time with them. And for the most part, most of them are really good guys who are already in a position where they're doing a lot of extra and it's not because of money. It's like from a genuine love for what they do and for helping kids. Cause God knows high school coaches don't get paid anything. Um, yeah. Nowhere near worth the hours they put in with just actually coaching. And then the, the hours they put in building relationships outside of that, that last a lifetime. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like oh, yeah. I, I will always remember coach Moncrief and he was like my seventh grade football coach you know, yeah. uh, well, and history teacher, which is an interesting thing you only really see in the South is, you know, the football coaches also being like history teachers. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was the deal. It was history or PE boy. And I'm like, that's what they were. Yeah. And I, my favorite thing would be like how he pronounced Sumerians. Cause yeah. I guess he was entertained by the word. So he'd be like the Sumerians. <laughs> i'm like your accent's not that thick until you say sumerians that's hilarious but uh yeah i like he has a lasting effect on me what um i would say like you got any hobbies outside of that though like besides shaping the future of america through the kids well what's something you do outside oh, yeah. of education like what's you what's something you're passionate about i like guns um, yeah yeah, man, I own uh, several of them. I shouldn't be surprised. And, from Alabama, you know, like that should have yeah, been like no, I should default like, like to that stuff, man. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I you know I, I like working out, although that you know I don't lift as much as I used to now because uh, mm -hmm. it, it does no good. Um, yeah. But uh, I do like guns, so I, I own a lot of guns. I like going out and shooting. Mm -hmm. um, not really a big hunter. I just like to to, to shoot stuff and like different guns. Man. That's really that's like the, yeah. I mean, it's the ultimate like boys will be boys you know i like to yeah, blow hey, things up people call it like ballistic therapy you know? like, <laughs> ballistic therapy ballistic I mean, therapy sometimes dude, when your stress is good go out and shoot some stuff man i mean you feel better i will look at it when me and my brother so we have a, a range like a kind of like homemade range out here in in oh, berryville yeah? on my farm yeah because you know we have a family farm out in berryville that we're starting to we my dad bought with intentions of retiring, but then he didn't retire. So we just have this big old farm that's not a farm that we're trying to like slowly help restore into a farm. Yeah. <laughs> so we have like a couple horses and some chickens and that's it. Um, so we built a range and I will tell you when we have range therapy, it'll be me, two of my brothers, um, at least two dozen guns <laughs> and yeah. we will like easily dump over a thousand rounds down range. Oh yeah easily like you yeah. uh can't do that nowadays we haven't had a we haven't had some range therapy in a while because of the cost of ammunition <laughs> which is ridiculous if yeah you find it man i'd be buying dime bags of 45 here soon shit <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, man, i need to come out there too dude i went i went home a couple weeks ago and my mm -hmm. brother wanted to do some shooting and we got a lot of land out there like my family my granddad and my mm -hmm. mom and uncle all. man we easily easily shot over a thousand rounds just like I had a couple of my ARs down there. Like I got a, I don't know what I had down there. Um, I got a 45 rifle, uh, carbine rifle that I had down there. I had a, I took, a, I took like over half of my guns down there, and <laughs> we were just like creating targets and just shooting, man. But it's like it's, it's fun to do. That's cool to me, and I also think that, you know, that's one of those skills that can come in handy. You know, if you need to take protect yourself or if you need to provide for your family. Mm -hmm. so uh, I think it's cool. also a discipline thing. So like I teach all my, like all of our brothers know how to shoot one because we're in the military and two, just growing up with Southern family. You know, my yeah. mom's from the deep woods of Kentucky and my dad's from the mountains of Tennessee. 
you know, like <laughs> we're just, uh, I'm sure I have shot sure. guns that some of my family are not legally supposed to own out in those mountains. Awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, 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 I'm young. I was like, I chalk it up to, Oh, I was young. So maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but I'm like, that was a fully automatic weapon. <laughs> no, yeah, dude. dude. When we record, I can't, but yeah. my little cousin <laughs> down there, I'm like, yeah, they like 12. And yeah. they all can fire ARs like and, and all kinds yeah. of other stuff. So uh, but I mean, you know, that's how it is when you're growing up in the country, man. It's it it didn't become a big deal um to me until I got mm-hmm. up here and I'm like, what? Because people used to drive to school. Like yeah. kids would drive to school and had their shotguns across the back of their truck. Yeah, like gun racks in them. the truck. Yeah, that's normal. <laughs> yeah. Um you don't you don't see that up here. And then the other thing is like um well uh what was I trying to say? Oh yeah. Um, the safety thing. So like, I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have is like, they'll see like people on the gun range, but they don't watch like the professional videos. They don't watch people who know what they're doing. They always watch the videos of people doing dumb shit. And that's what circulates the internet. I, I can't tell you how many people in Virginia, my brother has like educated because they'll be doing dumb shit when he takes them to the gun range. And he's like, well, what, what are you doing? Cut that out. You don't get to do that. This isn't a toy. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but it's a gun. We're having fun. He's like, no, put it down. Like, yep. that's not how you treat a gun. Like, the fun is when the rounds are going down range. Everything outside of that is strictly business. <laughs> you know, like, you you do not play with them. And, like, that, I think that's the, the uh, important thing that I like to teach. Like, I'm going to teach our kids. Like, as soon as they're old enough, I'm going to start teaching them gun safety. I grew up with a Boy Scout handbook that had gun safety in the handbook. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, we went with that old school Boy Scout handbook. Yeah. Um, I had a really interesting Boy Scouts unit. So like when I say Boy Scouts, everyone's like, Boy Scouts, what a nerd. And I'm like, yeah, except for all three of our Scout Masters were military. Yeah. You know, well, that um, makes a difference. yeah, Air, uh, Marine, Navy and Air and Air Force. And they were we got to like we did the all of our medic training. We're on the military medic dummies, the casualty dummies. So like yeah. putting the intestines down, like wrapping the intestines down, the sucking chest wounds, splinting with these really, as an adult, they don't look lifelike, but as a kid, they definitely yeah. look lifelike. <laughs> and uh, that was actually really fun. When I went to basic training, we were, uh, they had those things, the same ones. So like, I was like, oh, I got this. And I was actually yeah. the top, like, I got 100% marks on all of my medical, like my com my med- my combat lifesaver training, which is, which is what they call their you know in field oh, medical training. That's cool. And I was like, do you do you want me to put an IV in or something? Like, do we have to? And they're like, no, we we nix that from the program. You know how to put an IV in? And I'm like, yeah, man, we don't, <laughs> we don't fuck around with that shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good. I mean, you learn so many skills from that. Like, I was in mm-hmm. Boy Scouts, and then you had like 4-H club which was a big thing and learning about nature and stuff. And I get up here and a kid can't tell you anything and they can't grow crap. And so, but those are all normal things when I was growing up. Like you, like you had 4-H a day at school, like that was a big deal. And mm-hmm. being in the competitions and trying to advance, like that type of stuff was a big deal. And I, I feel like kids don't get enough of that today, man. Like it's, they, yeah, they it's don't. Just missing. Yeah, they don't. They don't. So, so shooting guns, man. Yeah. Shooting your guns. That's, that's a good hobby. Working out, I would like to say, so one of the problems is when I was in the military, I would have said working out was a hobby of mine. I would have because I got yeah. paid, you know, it was like, hey, you got downtime. What do you want to do? And gym's free. It's like five minutes down. You know, let's walk over to the gym and work out. I used to work out three times a day when I was in the military. I think I've worked out once in the last two weeks. Dude, <laughs> 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 yeah, COVID got me. I'm like, I'm ready to get back to a gym, but I can't right now, I, just, I hit the treadmill, and at this point, I gave up on a six-pack a long time ago. I'm just trying to be healthy. Yeah, That's so it. what gets me is, like, when I get to working out, I like it, and I get into it, but I actually have a, um, I think the term is disintegrating disc between my L4 yeah. and L5, so I'll get, like, sciatic pain, you know, after, like, a few days of working out, gotcha. and so I'm like, ooh, man, I got to let that die down. And so I won't work out. And then when the pain goes, I don't start working out again. And that like this, that fucks me up. So yeah. I, and part of the thing is I just got to knock up. I got to just go to a doctor and start the process for that. But I don't trust doctors, man. 
I know that sounds weird. You, you, it kind of sounds like how you say people don't trust teachers. <laughs> you know, you better go, man. Don't while you're young, because the older yeah. you get, the harder it gets to fix that shit. So, well, the one time I went, they almost killed me. You know. Well, that's a pretty good reason. But, yeah. Uh, you so I need to try a different one. <laughs> well, I had oh, a I had an intestinal issue, and I went to like a military doctor, and they misdiagnosed my issue. And that was part of my fault because I went so long because it's been like a generational thing. We don't go to doctors. Yeah. Um, but I finally said, all right, I go to the doctors. This is getting bad. My shit hurts. And they did all this and they're like, oh, we're going to say you have this. Here's the medicine for this mm-hmm. now. So they misdiagnosed me, but it wasn't that far off base. So the medicine would have still treated it. Yeah, I just sure. wasn't supposed to take it as long as they said. The other problem is they gave me four times the maximum recommended dose. Dang. Yeah. So I was taking like, bad. A, yeah, it was pretty bad. So what that called is caused is a side effect of pericarditis. So I had colitis, kind of, like my intestines were swollen shut pretty much. Um, that was painful as hell. That was painful. It was, it was horrible. And then while trying to deal with that because of these doctors messing up and they sent me home, I was home for two weeks on this medicine, my intestines still swollen shut. And then the muscles around my heart started swelling or like the fluid buildup and stuff. So my heart started choking itself. So my blood pressure was bottomed out out. and my resting resting heart heart rate rate was, uh, 180 was my resting heart rate. So I went to a doctor just like, Hey, I'm not feeling too good. Let's check this out. And while I was at the doctor's office, the nurse was like, don't move. And she left the room, came back. The doctor was like, check my, my heart rate. I was like, okay. Put up another blood pressure thing. He was like, all right, um, stay right here. Stay calm. We have an uh, ambulance on the way to come get you. And I was like, I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, you're going to the rest and emergency. You're going to the IC, you, you know, you're going, we're, we're having you transported there. I was like, I don't know, man, ambulances are kind of expensive, bro. Can I just have my dad drive me there? And they're like, <laughs> no, <laughs> they were, yeah, they were like, uh, they honestly, because in the main reason I went back to the hospital was because I passed out, passed out going up some steps Yeah, and they were like, you could have died. Yeah. So going up the steps, I could have died just any, any amount of exercise, I could have had a heart attack or like heart failure. So I get to that hospital. They're trying to figure out why that, why I have the pericarditis, what caused that while also trying to figure out my intestinal issue, trying to figure all this out. They're putting me through cat scans They're giving me treatments and you know, all this stuff going through my system starts to build up and my kidneys can't take it. So then I go into renal failure. Jesus. So my intestines are swollen shut. My heart's choking itself and my kidneys go into renal failure. So I'm in the hospital for maybe three months. Like, here's the worst part of all all this. I didn't tell my mom until like more than halfway through. Are you serious? I did not tell my mom more than halfway through because she lived in Kentucky. She has her own health issues. and I didn't want to worry her because I was like, it's fine. I'm going to be okay. And my wife told my mom smart woman i'm glad you married her yeah right um my mom got on a plane which she does not fly does not and flew up to come see me in the hospital and she was super nice but like the second i was better she's like you know i'm gonna fucking choke you <laughs> yeah you should have I'm not yeah, right. Right there. Yeah. oh my god yeah, let her it know was, what's up man yeah it was it was bad and um like i said i like it was one of those things that i i my heart was in the right place by not telling her but it was definitely a bad decision <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's all bad man but Give uh, a chance. yeah and then i think uh the craziest part about it was my dad didn't take it too serious and i think that was the part that kind of made me go okay this isn't that bad because my dad didn't take it too serious like he would come yeah. like he kind of came to the hospital once because I was staying with him for a little while this happened. And he was like, yeah, I had to clean up a lot of your dog's shit. Dog's pooping in the yard. I have to clean it up. Kind of getting tired of that. And I was like, oh, I know I'll be home soon. Oh, whatever. You know, and he kind of downplayed it. 
And he didn't tell a lot of the family either. So like my brothers didn't know. So I was actually telling this story to my sister-in-law and she was looking at me like, when did this happen? And she was like, were you young? And I was like, Sarah, this was like four months ago. What are you talking about? And she was like, what? <laughs> but I'd been, if I was your brother, I'd have been pissed. I might've punched you in the face. Yeah, he was, he was pretty, but like, I didn't think like one of the things is, Let's also talk about, I was in the hospital dying. So, you know, I wasn't calling everybody. My dad knew. So I assumed he would pass the word around. My dad is the worst about like keeping people in the loop. Like, yeah. When I was at AIT, my great grandmother died, who I grew up with. And he was supposed to tell me and he's like, I don't want to tell him while he's on duty. So I'll wait for him to come back, you know, and he forgot to tell me. Oh, wow. So I find out from my older brother setting up for a joke. So he was like telling a joke about like when he was at the wake and he was talking to somebody and he's like making a joke to them or like trying to, you know, be positive, like a, just a conversation. He was trying to, yeah. he was trying to tell me a story that happened while he was there for the funeral. And I was kind of like, what funeral? And he was like, the one we went to Tennessee for. And I was like, I thought you guys just went to Tennessee to go visit Tennessee. Whose funeral did you go to? And he's like, you're fucking with me right now, right? <laughs> He's like, um, I'm, I'm trying to set up for a joke here. And you're about to tell me that I'm, this is how I'm telling you your great grandmother died. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. He's like, oh, dude, this is fucked. Like he did not know what to, he was a deer in headlights. Like he's usually so like on top of it. Like he knows how to handle any situation. But in that situation, he was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and my dad was just like oh shit yeah my bad <laughs> god dang that's tough that is tough it's bad dude it's uh, a lot oh, this happens a lot I thought that was falling <laughs> yeah man i got oh, contract this year I thought, i'm like i thought that was falling dude i was about to dive out of this chair to try to catch this board from falling oh my god wow oh man i oh my kid he'll do this shit where he like he'll move a certain way and i'll be like on the ground catching that dot that you know that ball like i'll be like oh i got you and he'll just look at me like well, i'm fine i got it oh my god you little son of a bitch <laughs> oh he is oh my god he is you know we were talking about it um the statistical chance of him being a boy was actually like really low in the sense that my brothers so he has three cousins that are all boys so oh, nice. my brothers all had boys and so they were looking at it and they're like the statistical chance of all four of them being boys was like, I want to say like the probability was like 6%, like six point something percent. And I'm just like, man, we just don't have girls in this family. Hey, that's <laughs> cool though. I mean, your name will go on for a long time. Oh yeah. I definitely, you know, he's got the Richard in there. I put my dad's name in there just to try and make my dad cry and it worked. So oh, yeah. 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 So he's got, he's uh, his full name is Aiden Richard Timothy. So gotcha. I did the smart thing that my mom didn't do. And I moved Richard back to the middle name. So like Richard used to be the middle name for all my family. Like my granddad was Richard was the middle name. One of my uncles, Richard was the middle name. My mom had the bright idea. Let's put Richard as the first name. And so I grew up with the nickname Dick. <laughs> uh, uh, nice thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. It was not. It was not um oh, kids man. are ruthless man kids are ruthless yes they are so uh when i had aiden i was like i'm definitely gonna have richard in there because it's a family name but that's not gonna be your first name bro we're moving that we're moving that over <laughs> i'm putting it back in the middle that's wow that is wow yeah uh let me look that for you rich rich works for me yeah rich rich is good you know um i never liked rick you know you ever have that like there's like like nicknames and there's one that you don't know why you just don't like it people have called me richie rich richie rich yeah. um people call me by my middle name i've had people call me completely wrong name some girl thought i introduced myself as gerard and i don't know how she misheard it she was a hippie so she could have been high at the time probably yeah so but then like when she would talk about me to people she would talk about gerard so like people wouldn't know she was talking about me and they're like oh cool cool and so she went like 
I want to say like six months before I finally was like, are you calling me Gerard? And she was like, yeah, that's your name. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's nowhere near. You can keep calling me Gerard. I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me. I just had to make sure I was tracking that that's what you were calling me. That is hilarious. But I don't do Rick. That's the one thing. There's this one old guy I worked with. That who would call me. It does. It does. I guess. I don't know. I just, I just, Rick, Ricky, none of the Rick variations. I don't, I don't like, you know, that's not old. That's not like <laughs> Yeah. Old right. Divorce. Old divorce. Or like yeah. If my wife leaves me, I'll start going by Rick. <laughs> yeah. That's when it's appropriate then. To them is rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man. So, um, Ooh, I got these questions. I like to ask everybody towards the outro. I'm assuming you're a busy man. So you're probably getting close to having to, you know, your allotted hour where you actually have to be productive. Right. Oh yeah. I only got a 20 email since we've been talking. Literally. <laughs> All right. So let me hit you with these few like generic, like un unrelated to anything we've been talking about questions. Yes. Okay. Um, take, uh, you're a pretty healthy guy. So I don't know if this will really if these two first two questions will really mess with you. I don't know you. about that. <laughs> All right. So the best version of cake you've ever had. So whatever flavors, fillings, icings, take that version of cake, right? Yeah. And you're going to put it in a versus battle against the very best version of cheesecake you've had. All right. Which one wins? Dang, they're close to the same. Oh, I'm are a, they? <laughs> I'm going to go with strawberry shortcake okay see i'm one of those guys cheesecake be plain just plain cheesecake beats almost everything <laughs> cheesecake is great to me it, it tastes awesome but yeah. when you're lactose intolerant it, 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 yeah, it, 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 it anything you can imagine so it does mess me up i will say that <laughs> all right um rank in order waffles pancakes and french toast from your favorite oh. yeah Pancakes, waffles, French toast. French toast is dead last. I'm not crazy about French toast. God, thank you. I said this and my boss was like, yeah, get out. You're fired. <laughs> yeah, I'm not crazy about French toast at all. I think I think it's interesting because everyone I've talked to about this so far has had the same opinion on they either – French toast is nowhere in the middle. It's like French toast is the best golden standard or, nah, not my thing. Like there's no I in between. At all. No one puts French toast in the middle. They're either like diehard, definitely French toast first place, or they're like, can I just take French toast out of the running? You know? Yeah, I just don't see the point of it. All right. And my last question <laughs> is going to be, what is the lowest dollar amount that you would take to let Dwayne The Rock Johnson slap you in the face? Oh, man. That's a – the lowest dollar amount? Yeah. Like, what's the, the minimum you would accept? From him, he's rich. So <laughs> I would say uh, the lowest dollar amount. I don't know, man. If he let me hang out with him for a day, he could do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, what hey, do you want? Trailer, man. Let me see your side chicks and stuff. Down here. <laughs> free. I, I'm cool with that. I don't need the money. I told him I was like, man, as long as you sign it and put it on Instagram with my tag on there, but you know, at you know, at my little podcast on there, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm cool with that oh man um so you got any uh anything you want to make sure gets said before we end it any like you know things you want to bring attention to that uh, uh i make no, sure it gets to my audience say, uh, whenever you see a teacher tell them thank you and tell them they're doing an awesome job man that's that's about it just respect and love teachers man educators period educators yeah that's yeah. that's really it. They they had a rough time right now. I don't I don't think I've ever seen where any other industry at a moment in history has taken so much of a beating, um, unnecessary beating, and for such a sustained period of time during the pandemic. So I would just say tell them they're doing an awesome job. They're great, they're loved and respected. That's it. All right. Well, we'll do, coach. I think a lot of a lot of the people who follow me are are already on that same mindset. So I think that's a good thing. Um, appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me today. Of course, man. It's, it's always cool. fun. My first podcast. Yeah. It's definitely my first, though. So, I, yeah, I'll come back anytime. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you. You get to uh, to shape in the minds, all right? That's the plan, man. Looks like I got a lot of them. Some of them going to be hard. So, we'll get to it.
<laughs> hey man, you you were you were able to get me to be successful, so you know I'm sure none of them are lost causes. Nah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I see you around. Yeah, you All as right. well.